Well, welcome Crossroads Church. It is good to see you here today. I want to welcome Fort Lupton and Northland Campus, all of you joining online. I am Matt Manning, one of the pastors here today, and it is my privilege to start a brand new series with you uh, called Threads. And so I am excited for that series here at Crossroads Church. Uh, we oftentimes preach through a series where we take a book of a Bible or a topic, and we spend a couple weeks to a couple months saying everything that we uh, know to say about it, and then we move on to something else. And so we just came off a great, great series called Dungeons and Daylight, where we spent five weeks talking about mental health and the church. How many of you were a part of any part of that series? Just go ahead and raise your hand here, Thornton. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of you. It was an amazing, amazing series. If you missed that, my, my encouragement to you, I highly encourage you to go to crossroadsabc.com slash sermons or download the app and check that series out. It was that good. The church doesn't talk about mental illness enough. We took that on, and we want you to have that and for you to help you. Now today, we begin a brand new series called Threads, where we're looking at this biblical idea of shalom, all right? And as we kind of get way of getting started today, I realize that Monday is a big, big day uh, for many of us. That in the Manning household, it's, it's an even bigger day. Uh, because uh, September 11th, Monday, uh, my daughter Mercy turns five, okay? And so we say in the Manning house that on September 11th, God gave us mercy. And, uh, but for most of us, for most of us, it's even bigger than that. Uh, and the reason that it's big is because of what happened on that fateful day 16 years ago. Do you remember where you were at? Do you remember where you were Tuesday, September 11th, 2001? I remember vividly where I was. I was a 21-year-old junior at Grace University in Omaha, Nebraska. I had just finished an early morning class, and I was hurrying across campus back to the dorms. And the reason that I was in such a hurry is because a few days earlier, my roommates had bought for my birthday uh, the Xbox game NCAA football, all right? And this was all we were, cons- we were consumed with it. Like the whole hall was playing on this. In any waking moment where we had spare time, we were in front of the TV and playing this game and yelling and hollering and trash talking with each other. It was a blast, right? We were at a Christian college. We loved Jesus. We didn't have a care in the world. So I finished my early morning class. I'm heading across campus to Schmidt Hall where I lived. I walked up the three flights of stairs, entered into the common area where our TV was at. And when I walked into there, about 15 guys were standing around watching the TV. And instead of hooping and hollering and trash talking, it was this eerie silence. And my best friend and roommate was there. His name's Brett Kane. And I walked over to Brett and I said, man, what's going on? And he said, you'll never believe it. A plane has hit one of the World Trade Center buildings. And I kind of scooted into the, uh, with the guys and watching the TV. And a few moments after I started watching, another plane appeared out of the air, took a sharp turn, and, and ran into the South Tower at about the 60th floor. The collision caused debris and fire to, to splatter all over the buildings around it and into the streets below. I'll never forget when the news anchor came on the television there and declared that America was under attack. We watched, along with millions in our little common area, the events unfolding in New York. Soon we were taken to Washington, D.C., where American Airlines Flight 77 was circling over Washington, soon plummeting into the Pentagon, jet fuel causing an inferno. Fifteen minutes later, we were rushed back to New York as we watched the horrors unfold even more greatly as the South Tower fell and then soon the North with it. At the time, I was working at Youth for Christ, and I went uh, to the office that afternoon to grab something out of my desk, and as I pulled into the parking lot, I jumped out of my car, and above, out of kind of nowhere, were military jets scrambling everywhere. It was so loud, you couldn't even think. And then out of the blue, Air Force One flew right over top of the Youth for Christ offices on its way to the Strategic Air Command at Offutt Air Force Base, just south of Omaha, Nebraska. I walked into the office and my friend Allison was there and we started talking and praying through the events that we had, that we had witnessed in the six or seven hours earlier. And I looked at her and I said, Al, what's going on? America should not be under attack. The President of the United States should not be in Omaha, Nebraska. This is not the way that it's supposed to be. And maybe along with me, you've echoed, you echoed those words 16 years ago, that this is not the way that it's supposed to be. Surely you've echoed those words since, that moment when you realize that something is wrong, that something is missing, that this isn't the way that it's supposed to be. 
from the regrets of a life that might have been to the miseries of this world that we experience, the first world child who's born an addict to drugs because of what his or her mother put into their body during the pregnancy, the third world child who dies of a largely preventative disease, accidents where someone who, who needed to be paying attention on their job in order to protect people gets drunk or careless or preoccupied, tornadoes, earthquakes, wildfires, floods, shark attacks, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma. We travel down the road of life and we all realize pretty quickly that this isn't the way that it's supposed to be. That something is missing. That as we live out our lives, we look at it and we say, it ought to be different. Something is missing here. And that missing thing, the Bible has a word for it. The Bible calls that shalom. And at its most basic level, it means peace. Shalom means peace. And when we hear that, we go, yeah, 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 that's what I need. That's what I need. I need peace. That's what the world needs. The world needs peace. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for peace. And as we look out at this world and say that this isn't the way that it ought to be, this isn't the way that it's supposed to be, that something's missing, the Bible says that thing which is missing is shalom. That over these last few months, God has rocked my world when it comes to this, this idea of shalom. This idea of shalom. See, I believe from time to time that, that God rings our bell, that he, that he rocks our world, that he wakes us up to something that previously was going unseen. Whether that's an issue that's near and dear to his heart or, or a cause that, that he wants us to see in this world, that something is missing in our world and he wants us to see it. I call these second conversion experiences. Let me explain it to you this way. That all of us have a beginning, and all of us have an end. And the beginning is what we call birth, and the end is what we call death, and this is our life in between. Pretty simple. And I would imagine for a majority of us in this room, that at some point we've had an experience with Jesus. Where we went from unbelief to belief. Where we went from not knowing God to knowing Jesus as our Savior. That for a majority of us in this room, we've had a moment where we crossed the line of faith and became a Christian or a follower of Jesus or a believer. And then through my observation, through my own life and through church history, what I've observed is that after this moment, we have a series of smaller events that I'll just call second conversions. They're not as big as the first one. This isn't about losing your salvation where you don't believe anymore and then you come back to believing. That's not what I'm talking about at all. What I'm talking about is, is these moments where God wakes up and stirs in our souls something that begins to make us look and see the world differently. The first time that this happened to me was shortly after high school. Right after I graduated high school, before I wanted to be a pastor and all of that, I went on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic. And while I was there at the Dominican, a few days uh, while I was there, I had the opportunity to cross the border into Haiti. And every time I crossed into Haiti, what I saw and noticed was the deep poverty, the suffering and the despair, the darkness that was over that country. And on that day, God rung my bell in such a way where I began to look at suffering different. And I looked and I made a commitment on that day, if there was something that was suffering that was going on in this world that I could do something about than I was in. I was in. And so that conviction has led me back to Haiti in 2010 to help with uh, the earthquake there and, and relief in the earthquake. It's led me to Mali with AIDS. It's led me to Lebanon with the Syrian refugee crisis. I just believe strongly, I have a strong conviction that we as Christians cannot run away from the suffering, but we are to run into the middle of it, bringing the hope of Jesus. The second time I had one of these second conversion experiences it was 12 years ago in Kentucky that me and a group of guys were getting together and we were going to plan this amazing guys night out and we thought where can we go for an amazing guys night out and so just south of Louisville Kentucky is a town called Bardstown Kentucky and in Bardstown is the most awesome wicked awesome go-kart track you have ever seen all right it's a mile and a half long they make you wear helmets you go 60 miles an hour and they let you bump into each other this is amazing all right for guys this is our dream and so we're getting together and we're saying this is what we're going to do and so we go out and we start Start getting some guys to come with us, and and I went up to my buddy Mac, who was in his late 30s, 
And I said, hey, Mac, we're doing a, a guy's night out. You need to come with us. Now, Mac was a stand-up guy. In his early years, he was a boxer. He made the Olympic team. He had become a successful business owner. And uh, he loved Jesus and was just a really great guy. And Mac looked at me without hesitation and said, Matt, I can't go. I said, Mac, you didn't even look at your calendar. What do you mean you can't go? You need, you're coming. Let's go. And he goes, no, you can't go. I can't go. And I was like, Mac, I don't take no very well in general, but you're going to come with, all right? So, so just do whatever you need to do, and in a couple of weeks, we're doing this. You're coming with. And he goes, Matt, I can't go. You don't understand. I can't go. I said, Mac, I, I don't understand. What's, what's the big deal? He goes, Matt, black people can't go to Bardstown. 2005. Matt, people who go into that county, black people who go into that county, don't come back. I can't go. God rung my bell. For the majority of my life, I lived free of the burden of racism as a white male in this country. And right then and there, God rocked my world. See, these second conversion moments, I believe, are the work of the Holy Spirit. Where God comes in and rings our bell and wakes us up wakes us up to a conviction or a belief or an issue where he causes us to think bigger and differently and broader than maybe what we thought before. And he opens our eyes to the way that he sees the world and we're forever changed. A few months ago, I had another one of these experiences with this idea of shalom, where God rocked my world again. And eagerly over the last few months, I've been looking forward to this series and really, this series over these next three weeks is just what God has been doing in my own life and me just, just spilling it out into you. And my prayer for this entire series and leading up to this is that, that God would rock your world the way that he has rocked mine around this idea of shalom. And so for the next three weeks, this is the way it's going to work out. Today, we're going to talk about, about how to discover shalom. What is this? We're going to discover it together. And we're going to take a very intimate and personal look at it in our own lives. And the next week, we're going to broaden that a little bit about shalom in our communities, in our cities, and, and how we, we move this out beyond ourselves. And then the third week, I'm excited because we have plans where we are bringing out Pastor Hickmott from Beirut, Lebanon, here to Colorado, to Crossroads Church, to speak about shalom in the world and to give our, us a broader context in that, that this series is going to be good, and I'm praying that God would rock your world through that. So that's where we're going. Today, I want to begin to discover shalom with you. I want to just begin to explore this idea that we find throughout the, throughout the scriptures. And in doing so, I want us to peek into a conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. So if you have your Bible, John chapter 14 is where we're going to be. And as you're turning there, know that this is Jesus speaking to his disciples just a few days, really, before his death. That this is one of the last intimate moments that Jesus has with his disciples before the crucifixion. In John chapter 14, we have a piece of a conversation that is recorded for us in verse 27. And here's what Jesus says to his disciples. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. That Jesus gives these words to his disciples on the hills of one of the most dramatic scenes that we have in all of Scripture. Now the disciples, we have to remember, are Jesus' boys. That these guys are like family to him. For the last three years, they've walked together and they've learned to love each other and trust each other. They've seen Jesus do miraculous, miraculous things. That these guys are tight. And they're celebrating something called the Passover meal or the Passover feast. And the Passover feast goes all the way back to when Israel was a slave nation in Egypt. That for 400 years, Israel as a nation were slaves to the Egyptian uh, kingdom, to the Egyptian country. And God, through Moses, does this miraculous work. And this nation that had been enslaved for 400 years all of a sudden is free. And for 1,400 years after that, every year, even today... Every year they celebrate the Passover feast. It's a celebration of God's faithfulness, of, of what God has done and is doing, and how he worked all those years ago to free them from their slavery. That this is a time of great joy and great celebration in, in Jewish culture. 
And Jesus and his disciples are celebrating the, the, the Jewish Passover meal. They're coming together for this important celebratory meal. And him and his buds sit down at the table and they begin to eat. And Jesus leads the conversation with these words. Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me tonight. And just like you, the disciples freak. And one by one they come up to Jesus and they say, surely not I. Lord, surely not I. Lord, surely not I. Eventually, Judas kind of disappears from the dinner table. Jesus starts talking cryptically about suffering and death. And the disciples are in the room, and they're thinking, this is not the way that it ought to be. Jesus, you're the Messiah. This is not the way that it ought to be. And in that moment, this intimate moment, in one of the most dramatic scenes in all of Scripture, Everything that Jesus could have said, he stares into their souls and he says, peace I leave to you. What? Jesus, have you lost your mind? Are you crazy? Peace? You just said that us, one of your best buds, is going to betray you. You're talking about suffering and pain and death. If you die at the hands of Rome for treason, what does that become of us? Peace? Are you kidding me? Peace? Peace I leave to you. Now come on. When we read the scriptures in that context, we realize there must be something we don't understand. There must be something we don't get here. And the reason we're not understanding something is because of when we think of peace, it's much different than the way that Jesus thinks of peace. See, we get our peace from the Latin word pax. That's point number one in your outline. That pax means freedom from disturbance, quiet and tranquility. That that's the way that we think of peace. That if there's not tension between me and you, then we're at peace. That if countries are not at war, then, then we're at peace. This word pax in the Roman culture was used in contractual language. It was based on deeds and works and circumstances and you living up to your end of the deal. That as long as you did what I want, as long as you lived up to my expectations, then we would be in peace. Now come on. This is exactly the way that we think of peace in our, relation, in our relational culture today, isn't it? That as long as you do what I want, that as long as you do what I say, as long as you live up to my expectations, then there will be peace. And yet when Jesus says peace, he's not leaning on the Latin understanding of peace, pax. He's not leaning on pax. He's leaning on the Hebrew understanding of shalom. That's point number two in your outline. That shalom means wholeness, completeness, and the flourishing of, of God's creation. In this one Hebrew word rests God's original design for all of creation. That shalom is the way things were meant to be. That when Jesus says, peace I leave with you, he wasn't referring to civic peace between us he was hearkening back to the Old Testament idea of shalom. That throughout the Old Testament and into the New, we see this idea of shalom. That in the beginning, God created the world. And as he created the world, you can think of him of, of creating a, a fabric woven together, completely interdependent. Now, this is totally different, by the way. This is totally different than the way our Western minds think. See, let's say that this thread here represents your life, that this piece of thread represents your life. The way that we see it is that I'm free to do whatever I want, that I'm just a single piece of thread, that I'm not connected to anyone else or anything else, that I'm free to do what I want, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, that I make my decisions, and as I make my decisions, they don't affect anybody else because I'm not attached to anybody else. It doesn't affect anything else because I'm not attached to anything else. That I'm just a single piece of thread, completely independent to do whatever I want to do. That Gary Weaver, a PhD, says almost every American wants to picture himself or herself wearing a cowboy hat. Why? Because when Americans think of a cowboy, 
they picture a lone individual sitting on a horse out on the prairie. Cowboys, they never traveled in groups. They were men of action, self-reliant, independent individuals who survived with any help from anyone else. For Americans, this is one of our highest cultural values. Shalom grades against our values as Americans. But if I was to throw down this thread that represents your life and then pile a thousand threads on top of it, I wouldn't have a woven fabric. I would just have a thousand threads piled on top of one another. But if I was to take this thread and, and begin to weave it with other thread, in and over and, and through one another, that eventually, eventually, I would get something that looks a little bit like this. This is a blanket that my mother-in-law made for my wife when she was a little kid. That the, the more interconnected and intertwined and interwoven the, the thread becomes, the more beautiful and warm and strong it will be. That's shalom. A webbing of interdependence Wholeness, harmony, flourishing, delight between God, His people, and His creation. The theologian Cornelius Plantinga Jr. describes Shalom this way. The webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight is what the Hebrew prophets call Shalom. We call it peace, but it means far more than peace of mind or a ceasefire between enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness and delight, a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts are fruitfully employed. A state of affair that inspires joyful wonder as, a, as its creator and savior opens its doors and welcomes the creatures in in whom he delights. Shalom, in other words, is the way that things ought to be. What Plantinga describes is exactly the way that the Jewish mind thinks about shalom. That if you ever have the opportunity to go to Israel with Pastor Kim, one of the first things that you'll notice when you get off the plane is that every Jewish person greets you with the word shalom. And after you have a conversation with them, they will close the conversation by saying shalom. It's way better than our, hey, how you doing? That for them, shalom is both the beginning and the end and everything in between. See, they begin a conversation with shalom as a way of declaring God's presence is among us right now. It's a way of acknowledging that you are a, an image bearer of God, that you've been made in the image of God. And as an image bearer of God, their prayer for you is God's flourishing and his blessing upon you in this world. And as they close the conversation with shalom, it's a way of, of praying, sending you off with a prayer that may the presence of God be with you. May you walk in his peace wherever you go. It's why when you're reading the New Testament, Paul and John and Peter begin their letters with this, grace and peace of the Father to you. That it's not just a repetitive phrase in, in Israel. It's an intentional language communicating wholeness, perfection, flourishing, delight. And we look at this and we go, if shalom is so great, if shalom is the way that things were meant to be, what happened? Why don't I feel it? Why don't I know it in my life? Where is this shalom at? What happened to it? Well, what happened is the fall of Genesis chapter 3. See, when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, shalom was vandalized. Shalom was damaged. From then on, sin and pain and selfishness of people ruled God's creation. Natural disasters plagued the world. After the fall, when God came walking into the garden, Adam and Eve did not run toward him. They ran away from him in their shame. The shalom was vandalized. And throughout the rest of history, God has been working to bring back the shalom order. Through Jesus, God desires shalom relationships and shalom rhythm in this world. And so the question then becomes for us, if God desires it, how do we get it? How do we find it? How do we make it our own? King David, in, in a psalm that he wrote, Psalm 34, gives us a hint. He says this, turn away from evil, do good, seek shalom, and pursue it. 
that we live in a broken world, a sinful world. And because of that, we cannot just sit back and wait for shalom to fall upon us. It doesn't work that way. That we have to listen to the words of David where he says, seek this shalom, pursue it. That Dr. Megan DeVore, professor of church history at CCU, and a leading voice in our nation when it comes to shalom and human flourishing. You may recognize her last name because she is the brighter and better half of Pastor Trevor DeVore here at Thornton Campus. Her work on human flourishing has been so valuable to me. She wrote a paper that's amazing. Her feedback into the sermon series has been helpful. Here's what she says. That shalom is always, always, always associated with God's redeeming work. It is comprehensive as well as personal. It is an act of flourishing that comes as a result of God's reign. Point number three. Seeking shalom begins with the redeeming work of Jesus in our hearts and in our minds. Now listen to me on this. Our longing for shalom, our yearning for shalom in this world, will not happen until we begin to have shalom in our hearts. That the shalom that we long for in this world will not happen until it starts right here in me. That Jesus hits to the core of this in John chapter 1, verse 35. He says this, or here's the story. The next day, again, John, and this is John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus and he walked by and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. They started stalking him. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What is it that you're seeking? What are you seeking? Now it's curious to me that the first question that Jesus asked these would-be disciples of his is, What do you seek? In other words, what is it that you want? What is it that you desire? See, this is a question not of belief, but a question of desire. It's not a question of what do you think. It's a question of what do you love. What are you after in this world? And what Jesus is pointing to is is so crucial to our understanding, not only of shalom, but also ourselves. In asking this question, Jesus is pointing to the core of who we are. That what I desire, that, that what I love, is who I am. That that's the way that we were created. To be human is to have a heart. That you cannot not love. We are what we love. The great philosopher and and theologian Augustine has a work called Confessions. It's, It's a great, great work. And he says it this way, that the teleological aspect of your heart, now teleological just means end or purpose or goal, that the goal of your heart is to find its end in God. Because we are made to love the one who made and loves us. We will find our peace, our rest, our shalom, when our loves are rightly ordered to this ultimate end. And since our hearts are made to find their end in God, we will experience difficulty, anxiety, and restlessness when we try to love substitutes in this world. See, the question that Jesus is asking is not whether you'll love something as ultimate, but the question is, what do you love as ultimate. You are what you love. When you showed up today, what was it that you were seeking? When you showed up today, what is it that you were desiring? When you sing these songs and when we open God's word, what is it that you're looking for? You are what you love. And the answer to that question reveals what's truly going on inside of your heart. And when you get to the point where you love God as ultimate, above everything else, then the redeeming of our minds begins. And this is really important to understanding shalom. Because there's a worldly peace that's out there. And worldly peace says this, that if I can just forget what's going on in the world, if I can somehow just remove myself from it, if I can just find that happy place, then somehow it will be better and I will experience peace. And the Bible says that is foolish. That the only way 
that we find true peace is when we start thinking about the implications of this world and this life. How did I get here? Where did I come from? What's my purpose? How do I find it? In other words, what are the true implications of my life? And in steps the Christian worldview. And the Christian worldview says that there is a God. And that God designed you to have fellowship with him. And that he created this perfect world where there were no tears and pain and suffering. There was no death. Originally, it was perfect. And God lived there and he wanted us to live there with him. But of course, it all went wrong. And we turned on him. And the world is broken. And yet he did not leave us there. That he sent his son in to rescue us, to, to put it back together. And now he's creating this new heavens and this new earth for us to dwell with him, to live with him forever and ever. And we look at the Christian worldview and we look at God and we say, do you see your value? Do you see how much you're loved? Look at the fact that your future is being secure. Paul in Philippians chapter 4 says, whatever is true, noble, and right, think about these things and the God of peace will be with you. Now, most people in our world have trouble understanding shalom. They have trouble understanding the positive concept of peace. And the reason for that is because it's so easy for us to default to Roman thinking of Pax. See, in a way, we're all really good Roman thinkers. Where we let our performance and our deeds and our good works and our circumstances dictate our sense of peace. And the peace that Jesus speaks of is not dependent on circumstance. It's a gift. It's a gift given to us by God that my God grants peace through the renewing of my heart and my mind in Jesus. So when Jesus comes and says to me, peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. The peace that Jesus is referring to is not Pax, it's Shalom. It's shalom that enables those of us in him to remain calm in the most fearful and painful of circumstances. It's the kind of peace that enables us to, to hush a cry, rejoice in the pain of trial, and to sing songs in the midst of suffering. That shalom is the vision of God for this world that he set forth in the garden and the restoration that he desires in its broken relationships. That peace for a hurting soul and restoration for a fragmented world. That when we begin to experience shalom, we begin to dream like the saints of old dreamt. Where we begin to see peace moving from us, inside of us, and into our communities, our cities, and into the world. Peace I leave with you. Now as we wrap this up, I know, I know that for many of you, you're here today and you've never experienced this God of peace. And maybe for the first time ever, you walked in here today, not knowing what you were looking for, just knowing that something was missing inside of you. And maybe for the first time, you heard of a God who wants a relationship with you, who sent his son to die for you, for your sins, so that you might have life and so you can experience shalom. And as I say that, I also realize that there are a number, a number of people here who just haven't experienced shalom in a while. And for you, it's not a salvation thing that you know God, you know Jesus, He's your Savior. It's just been a while since you've talked to Him. It's just been a while. And you've been going through life, and you're experiencing the difficulty and the anxiety and the restlessness of trying to love substitutes for God. And today, I believe that Jesus is peering into your soul and saying to you, O oh, restless soul, what is it that you seek? What is it that you desire? What is it that you showed up wanting today? If that answer for you is Jesus, I want to pray for you. Will everybody bow their heads as we wrap this up in prayer? Father, we come to you God, knowing that something is missing in this world. 
God, we, we are reminded of that daily. We just look back over the last few weeks and, and can see the tension that, that our country has with North Korea. We watch the devastations of the fires in the north and, and, and entire cities underwater because of floods in Texas and, and Hurricane Irma knocking on the door of Florida. And we look at all of this and we realize the brokenness in this world. And as we turn our minds to your word in the midst of all of that, we're reminded that on the evening before your death, as you were looking at suffering and pain in which none of us know, you looked at your disciples and said, peace be with you. God, we want to know that kind of peace. We want to experience that kind of peace, and we know that it only comes from you. And so, God, I pray for those in this room and across our campuses and even watching online who do not, not, who do not yet know you as Lord. Lord, I pray that you open the door to their soul today, and they look to you and say, God, it's you who I trust. Jesus, I know that, that you died for my sin and I'm trusting in you to give me life. God, will you give them shalom? And for those of us, Lord, where, where we know what this shalom thing is, but it's just been a long time. God, I pray that you would retune our desires. Lord, somewhere we just forgot our first love. Lord, I pray that, that you would open our hearts back to you. That as we wandered into this place today, Lord, that it was you who we find. And so, God, I pray that your peace would come upon your people now. And, Lord, that we would know it and that we would feel it. So as we close with singing our final songs, Father, I pray that it's not just words from our lips but it's the desire of our heart to see you glorified in our lives and in this world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.